Good evening. My name is Kaushal Chala, CEO of the Charles B. Wong Community Health Center. Welcome to the Chinatown Health Clinic Foundation's virtual celebration to commemorate 50 years of bringing high quality health care to our community and to honor the wonderful staff that have made those past 50 years possible. I'd like to give a special shout out to the co-chairs for making this evening possible. Dr. Raymond Fong, Marie Lam, Sandy Lee Kawano, and Ken Chin. And as many of you know, Jane Eng, my predecessor, retired last year after a remarkable 40 year career. We look forward to honoring her at the next in person gala. Now, let's introduce our MCs for tonight. Melissa Lee is the host of CNBC's Fast Money and Options Action. A Harvard graduate with honors, Melissa has reported numerous documentaries for the network, including a recent special called Race and Opportunity in America, the Asian American Experience. She has also received nominations and awards, including Gracie, Gerald Loeb, and Emmy Awards. And our co-MC, David Henry Huang, a Tony Award-winning playwright known for his work on M. Butterfly, Chinglish, Yellow Face, and more. He is a Tony Award winner and three-time nominee, a two-time Grammy Award winner, a three-time Obie Award winner, and a three-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Take it away, Melissa and David. Thank you so much for the warm introduction, Kaushal. Good evening, friends and supporters. We are so grateful to be with so many of you virtually tonight. We promise a wonderful evening and a truly unique event. And I'm super excited to be with Melissa and with all of you here tonight. Um, hope you're comfortable because we've got some really fun things planned for you and uh, an exciting live ask and a amazing performance by uh, violinist Cho Liang, Jimmy to his friends, uh, Lin and the pianist John Kimura Parker. And if you have friends that wanna join us, it's not too late. Just ask them to visit www.bitly.com slash chcf2021. It is a party after all, so join in. <laughs> the mission of the Chinatown Health Clinic Foundation is to improve access to quality health care for underserved Asian American and other vulnerable populations. I know many of you have uh, similar passions out there. There will be many opportunities to show your support and donate throughout this program. 
simply click on the donate button of your screen. Your contributions will be used to support the delivery of essential health care services during this pandemic and afterwards during the recovery as well. Now keep in mind that your pledges will not count unless you check out at the end of the program. So do not forget to check out that pledge card. And of course, we are all here tonight to celebrate a monumental milestone at the 50th anniversary of the Charles B. Wong Community Health Center. So let's take a look at how their small beginnings have grown over the years. The Charles B. Wong Community Health Center has served the Asian American community in the New York metropolitan area since its establishment in 1971. That year, a group of volunteers organized a 10-day health fair in Chinatown, the first of its kind to be held in the community, which served more than 2,500 people who did not have access to health services in their own language. Following the tremendous community response, the Chinatown Health Clinic opened its doors that same year. Their mission to improve access to quality health care for underserved Asian Americans and other vulnerable populations has remained unchanged. When we first started in 1971, most Chinatown residents were unable to access affordable health care due to language barriers and the absence of medical insurance. We had our first health fair in the summer of 1971 and closed off Mott Street for 10 days. With the participation of many of the hospitals and health care institutions in the area, we were able to bring the examining room to the community. After the health fair, we were office based at the Church of Our Savior by Father Paul Tong, and it was on Henry Street. The way we first recruited doctors was going into the New York City phone book and reached out to all the doctors who had Chinese sounding names and sent letters out for volunteers and supplies. We had only received one reply. Dr. Samuel Ye, who became one of the three founding physicians of the Chinatown Health Clinic and has donated his professional services to the community for more than 50 years. We started from incredibly humble beginnings and thrived from the dedication of all the volunteers that believed in our mission to deliver health care to the underserved. In 1973, I first volunteered at the Chinatown Health Clinic, running the TB testing booth for their street fair. And back then, we were a free clinic, and I was a nurse at Bellevue Hospital. From that moment on, I was hooked, and I have been involved with the health center ever since. The vision and energy of our founders, Marie Lam, Tom Tam, Regina Lee, and Dr. John Lee, inspired many of us to serve. We became the little clinic that could, and nothing could stop us. In 1975, we established Project Ahead, which was a career training program for Asian Americans and has hence become nationally recognized for training Asian Americans in the field of healthcare. With over 600 alumni from our program, Project Ahead, we are proud to have many continue to serve our health center today including our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Perry Pong. As our community grew and expanded with the growing population, so did the Health Center. In 1999, we purchased a landmark building at 268 Canal Street, our flagship center, and it's proudly owned by the Chinatown Health Clinic Foundation. We changed our name in 2002 the Charles B. Wong Community Health Center, forming a new relationship with the Charles B. Wong family. Seeing that many of our patients were starting to move to Queens and the other boroughs, we made a strategic decision to open a health center in Flushing in 1997. Now we have two sites there and a new building on the way. Over the last 50 years, the health center has grown by leaps and bounds. We now have more than 480 employees working at five sites, and we provide close to 300,000 patient visits a year to the community. 
The Charles B. Wong Community Health Center was a founding member of APCHO, the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, way back in 1985. We continue to work with APCHO and our sister community health centers, serving the Asian American community all over the United States. We share health education materials and advocate for the rights of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and other Pacific Islanders, particularly during the past year when we have seen attacks and violence against Asian Americans. The Charles B. Wong Community Health Center was named National Quality Leader for the sixth consecutive year by the federal government, by the Health Resources and Services Administration. We are one of only three health centers recipients in New York State to be recognized as a national quality leader in 2020. Since its founding, the Health Center has expanded to five locations throughout the New York metropolitan area and offers a wide array of services including internal medicine, obstetrics and gynecology, pediatrics, dental care, mental health, social work, and health education. Their doors have remained open throughout the entirety of the COVID-19 global pandemic. The health center quickly adapted to be a part of the public health response by launching telehealth services and offering testing and education in the community. Now, they play a major role in the administering of the COVID-19 vaccine. The communities we serve have been hit hard during this pandemic, but we believe we're uniquely positioned to provide access to those who are most vulnerable and at risk. It's our bread and butter. This is what we do and it's part of our mission. We started COVID vaccinations in December. As of early April, we have administered over 22,000 vaccinations to many members of our community. This includes our staff, our community providers and partners, and of course, to our patients who live and work in this community. I am so proud of the efforts we have collectively made to help fill the gaps in our community and push us closer to ending this pandemic. Looking ahead to brighter days, the Health Center has plans to expand its legacy with the opening of the Health View Building in Flushing, Queens. We believe we can have an even greater impact for Asian Americans and other vulnerable populations. The Charles B. Wong Community Health Center is in the process of building Health View, an 82,000 square foot multi-story healthcare home in the heart of downtown Flushing. This primary care facility will provide medical, dental, mental health, and other services. There is a great need for culturally competent, high quality, and affordable dental and mental health care in Queens and we are particularly excited to expand access to these services. HealthView will have 17 dental operatories, which will bring our dental services to Queens. HealthView is a $75 million project financed through donor contributions, build NYC bonds, new market tax credits, and grant funding. Fundraising and capital campaign efforts are ongoing. Projected to open in the spring of 2022, HealthView is our path to expanding high quality services to those who need it most. In the years ahead, we will proudly continue to bring world-class healthcare to those who need it most, regardless of their means. This is what we have always done since our founding and what we will continue to do working together to forge a healthier future. Congratulations again to the Charles B. Wong Community Health Center. Thank you so much for all the great work that you do and continue to do for our community. Now, next up is an exciting panel to discuss the latest on COVID-19, moderated by my colleague at MSNBC, Richard Louie. Richard's a veteran and award-winning journalist with more than 30 years in television, film, technology, and business, currently at MSNBC and previously with CNN Worldwide. He is the first Asian American man to anchor a daily national cable news program and a Team Emmy and Peabody winner. His new book titled, Enough About Me, The Unexpected Power of Selflessness, 
taps into the power of how and why living selflessly can bring joy despite difficulty. Thank you, Melissa, for that introduction. I am certainly honored, first of all, to support a very important uh, purpose and a, an important part of our API community. I'm honored uh, to be with all of you tonight. In a moment, we'll be hearing from the two renowned doctors to discuss the science behind the COVID-19 virus. And our first guest is Dr. David Ho, who I've had the opportunity to speak with several times throughout the last year. Really an amazing voice. Uh, the founding scientific director of the Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center and the Clyde and Helen Wu Professor of Medicine at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Now, he received, as many of you might know, his degree from the California Institute of Technology, also Harvard Medical School. He has been at the forefront of AIDS research for 40 years. Uh, and recently, he is devoting a considerable amount of his effort redirecting a lot of his team's energy and his own energy to develop novel strategies to diagnose, treat, and prevent COVID-19 infections. Also with Dr. Ho is Dr. Lena Wen, an emergency physician and public health professor at George Washington University, a contributing columnist for the Washington Post and an on-air commentator for CNN as a medical analyst. And previously she served as Baltimore's health commissioner. She's the author of the critically acclaimed book, When Doctors Don't Listen, How to Avoid Misdiagnoses and Unnecessary Tests and the author also of the forthcoming book, Lifelines, A Doctor's Journey in the Fight for Public Health. It really is a pleasure to introduce two people that I have met and spoken with before. They will certainly set off a dynamic conversation on a topic of our time that there are certainly more questions sometimes than our answers. Dr. David Ho, Dr. Lena Wen. Hello, everyone. And let's uh, begin this conversation about what's going on with the pandemic. Obviously, everyone knows that this pandemic is still raging, um, and, but the vaccines are rolling out. Uh, how do you feel about the uh, impact of the vaccines on the current trajectory uh, for the pandemic? Well, first of all, I just wanna say how amazing it is to be joining you today. So thank you and great to join all of you today, virtually too. You know, we are in a uncertain stage of the pandemic, I think, where we are in a way seeing a fourth surge in certain parts of the country. We're seeing a rise in the number of infections, which is really unfortunate because we now have safe and effective vaccines that are our way out of this pandemic. But at the same time, we're also seeing two other factors. One of them is more contagious variants that are also more virulent and have the ability to spread even more easily and cause more harm. And the other major factor is human behavior, is that I understand that everybody has pandemic fatigue more than a year into this, and we cannot wait for things to end. But at the same time, it is the activities that people are engaged in letting down our guards too soon before being vaccinated. And unfortunately, that's driving up the surge and prolonging the period of time that we're going to see before we can come to an end of this pandemic. How you think we're doing when it comes to vaccine development? How well do you think these vaccines work? Um, and what are some things that you would be concerned about going into the next several months? Well, I think the vaccines are a real pleasant surprise. The Moderna Pfizer vaccines with efficacies north of 90% uh, certainly impressive. Um, and of course, there's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. That too is uh, quite protected. And, and so these are amazing achievements uh, that have been made uh, in a short period of time. That said, uh, we, we are still worried about whether the vaccines will protect against the new variants. Uh, and in particular, variants such as the one that emerged from South Africa and very certain variants, even uh, from New York City. That's what I'm worried about in terms of uh, compromising vaccine efficacy. The development of these mRNA vaccines have occurred, some people say have occurred so soon, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. And that's been one of the 
one of the issues raised by individuals who may be hesitant about getting the vaccine. And I wonder if I can ask you, as someone who is a who is a noted scientist exactly in this area, how you would go about reassuring people about the safety and the process of development of, of these vaccines. Yes, I think that's a pretty important question. People th b believe that such vaccines just emerge from nowhere. That That is not the case. Such a mRNA platform technology has been in the works uh, for over a decade. When the pandemic hit and the technology was applied to SARS-CoV-2, uh, you know, it went into a whole series of clinical trials and there were uh, essentially very little uh, side effects and, and non-major side effects. So um, one should not be hesitant for that particular reason. Uh, and certainly myself, I have taken it, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you have as well. I think one should uh, dispense with that misconception that the, these are just untested novel technologies. They've been in development for a long time. I, I'm just wondering if you have any uh, thoughts on what's causing a significant fr segment of the public to be so hesitant about vaccines aside from this side effect issue. I think it's important that we do talk about the public and the many reasons that people may have that are causing concern. Because I think there is a tendency sometimes to label people who are concerned about the vaccines, have questions about the vaccine, in the same boat as we label people who are actually anti-vaccine activists and do not believe in science. I think there are a lot of people though in that middle ground. And I think a lot of people didn't want to be the first ones to get the vaccine. Actually, you saw that for a lot of healthcare pr providers too. But then actually once they saw their colleagues get it, and now we have over 100 million people who have received the vaccines in the US, um, I think a lot of people are saying, okay, I feel good about that now. I also think a lot of people are in the category of, I want to get the vaccine, but I just have so much else going on in my life. And I think for these individuals, it's not actually overcoming hesitance. It's making vaccination the easy and convenient choice for people by going to where people are and not having these really complicated scheduling mechanisms for them. It's convenience and access, not actually some fundamental concern about the vaccine. And then I think beyond that, there is a group who are concerned about something specific about the vaccine. And I know, David, you feel, as I do, that we need to talk to people and meet them where they are, not with judgment. And I know that some, pe some people will, will say, well, I already had COVID, or um, I'm concerned that I might get coronavirus from the vaccine. On the one hand, you talk about how um, this the vaccine will probably protect you better than natural infection, and also that this does not contain the live virus, so you're not going to get coronavirus from the vaccine. I think meeting people where they are with the specific concern is very important. Um, and Dr. Ho, can I ask you also about whether you think this kind of technology will have uses beyond COVID-19 in the future too? Yes, I think, you know, both the mRNA uh, platform technology as well as some of the viral vector uh, technologies could be applied to other infectious diseases. And in fact, some of them are already in progress long before this pandemic. So the work that's going on now is definitely going to be relevant and helpful uh, to other vac vaccination efforts. Do you have any thoughts about how we go about easing the masking, the social distancing, as well as modifying quarantine procedures post uh, exposure? I am of two minds here because I think that what the Biden administration has been doing, their approach has been to say, let's look at things on a societal level. So ideally, we want for the level of COVID-19 infection to be below 10,000 infections a day. At that point, even if we have not reached the so-called herd immunity, at least we have suppressed the level of infection enough, and maybe we can ease societal restrictions at that point. I'm not sure that that's the best approach in the US. And I actually think that if we can frame it more of you are now fully vaccinated, therefore you can go back and travel and go to restaurants and see your friends and family. 
I actually think that that's a better approach than we all have to reach 65% as society. Um, I mean, that's my point of view. Um, Dr. Ho, I, I'd love to hear what, what you think about this too. Um, and also, what do you think in terms of specific metrics that we should be hitting? When you look at certain pockets here and there, you're going to have very different conditions. And those local conditions should influence one's uh, decision. And, and so I, I, I do agree with you. I think especially for those who have been vaccinated, we should strive for uh, return to normalcy. Um, you know, not, not in a uh, irresponsible way, obviously. Um, but, but that is the ultimate goal of uh, trying to vaccinate the, the large majority of the population. If I could just ask you to talk about herd immunity, um, especially when it comes to to COVID nineteen, and then I can maybe talk more about what how some yeah. some more ideas for how we can get there. Various people have been talking about herd immunity for quite a long time now. Herd immunity means, simply means immunity built up from vaccine or previous infection, and then you know the question is what level uh, in the population would be protective for even those who have not been vaccinated or previously exposed to the virus. Uh, and generally, it's been said that you need you know, a, a figure wave about uh, 70, 75%. But it's not a, you know, it's a sharp transition. It's obviously a gradation. And, and uh, the more, the better. I am really concerned that we're not going to reach herd immunity as a country. Um, I think that there is a substantial proportion of people who are not going to be vaccinated. And especially because children um, are not yet in the group that is able to be vaccinated, it's going to be hard because um, it's just going to be difficult to reach the 70 to 85 percent or, or whatever number if we have 20 percent of the population that's unable to be vaccinated because they're kids. And as the mom of two young children, I am eager for my kids to be vaccinated when the vaccine is available, but it may not be until 2022. And so I do have a lot of concerns about what, how the next several months will unfold and what's going to happen in the future. I'd love to ask you, um, David, about the, the future and where you think we're going to be in a year's time. I think you're, you're right in terms of we not reaching 75, 80% herd immunity. I think it will be a figure lower than that, at least for this year. Um, and, and so we will still have to deal with this, this virus. Uh, but I do think that as we roll out the vaccine to, say, 50 60 percent, uh, that should blunt the spread of the virus and, and hopefully we're in a bit better place overall. And then, you know, I'm looking to have better and better therapies that are coming along. So I do see the situation becoming better, but I don't see the pandemic suddenly disappearing by the second half of this year. Um, but I hope that we would be able to uh, return to, to some semblance of normalcy uh, uh, in six months in, uh, within a year. I hope there isn't a real bad variant that emerge, emerges and, and you know, derail all the current vaccines. And that's why it's so important that we outpace the emergence of variants by, uh, a, by expediting uh, vaccine rollout as quickly as we can. It's been a real pleasure chatting with you, uh, having seen you uh, talking about the pandemic on television uh, on numerous occasions. Thank you very much. And Dr. Ho, we all admire you and thank you for your contributions to science and humanity. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Well, Dr. Ho and Dr. Wen, thank you so much for joining us tonight for your dedication and forging a path for a healthier future and for being members of our community. I've certainly learned some new things. Um, science is amazing. And I hope you all at home have learned a lot too. Um, so let's all do our part in keeping each other safe and healthy. And now I have the great honor of introducing my friends, renowned violinists, Jimmy Lin and pianist John Kimura Parker. 
and they are going to be performing a duet rendition of Sonatina Finale by Antonin Dvorak. <laughs> Thank you. 
What a beautiful and amazing virtuoso performance. Thank you so much, Jimmy and John. So we've learned some insightful information about the science of COVID-19. And now let's talk about the effects that this virus has had on the ground level within our own community. Please welcome our guests, Sophia Eng Sao and Dr. Margaret Wu. Sophia is the Executive Vice President at Po Wing Hong Food Market located in Manhattan's Chinatown. It was established more than 40 years ago by her parents, Patrick and Nancy Eng. Active in Asian community affairs, Sophia's family is part of many local community nonprofit organizations. She has been featured in publications such as the New York Times and most recently on the Thrillist Explorers podcast. Sophia currently sits on the board of directors at the Charles B. Wong Community Health Center. And Dr. Margaret Wu is the Chief of Pediatrics at the Flushing site of the Charles B. Wong Community Health Center. She also oversees the Special Needs Care Management Team at the Flushing site. Dr. Wu previously worked in the Chinatown community in private practice, where she developed her passion for providing primary care to the underserved community. Um, ladies, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us and being part of the celebration. Um, I did want to talk to you. Uh, the Chinese American community and, and the Chinatown community has been dealing with the twin virus uh, this past year of COVID and racism. So Sophia, can you tell us, first of all, how the pandemic has impacted your business? Well, even before the uh, New York City lockdown, we have heard so much about the virus there was so much fear in the community. And that was pretty detrimental to businesses already. Um, a lot of the restaurants had already seen a decline in reservations and lots of cancellations. It was very heartbreaking to see, especially as a small business owner, this whole Chinatown ecosystem took a huge impact even before there was a, a, any true lockdown in New York City. And there are so many things that were unknown in the early days of the pandemic. I mean, people were wiping down groceries. They didn't want to touch anything. Yeah, exactly. Um, my employees even um, called out sick constantly because they were fearful of taking the subway and fearful of wearing masks, even though they knew that that was the right thing to do. But they were afraid of being um, they were afraid of being attacked because of this unknown virus going around and they didn't want to be a target of racist attacks. And that was a very fearful time for us. Um, not just what's going right on right now, it's just an extension of what's been going on for almost two years now. Dr. Wu, tell us about the early days of the pandemic and, and what you saw and how the community uh, responded. Um, I think as, as Sophia said, we realized very early in the Chinese community that um, that this was something serious. There was a lot of fear, a lot of concerns about whether it was work uh, safe to work, whether it was you know safe to go out um, to buy groceries, to go to the restaurant, to do all those things. And the Chinese American community started to mask very early on, um, and I think they recognized that it was some protection, even though CDC and and other um, other uh, institutions were not necessarily making that recommendation. They already um, started to do that. Unfortunately, that did make us a target in, in some situations. I think what's interesting is that both of you had brought up the issue of racism way earlier than, than today in the past few weeks, where the mainstream media has sort of picked up on this because of, of the wave of really violent um, attacks that have been captured on video and so have been presented to the public as a true issue. But Dr. Wu, you, you say that even early, early on, this has been an issue. Absolutely. I think the recent extreme violence has mm -hmm. brought it into the light of the media. But I, I, for certain, I think our friends, our families, our colleagues were seeing it um, very early on. You know, unfortunately, the, the more extreme events recently, like the spa shootings in Atlanta, unfortunately led to loss of life. But there are so many attacks which did not, fortunately, uh, did not uh, lead to severe um, severe injuries or loss of life. But it, it doesn't mean that they didn't happen. Um, and unfortunately, there are many attacks which weren't reported due to language issues, language barriers. Um, you know, not all these attacks are reported. What do you think has changed in the community over the past, you know, six to however many months uh, where the racism existed and there were cases, uh, nobody spoke up about them, to today where there are more and more people who are reporting it, who are capturing these on, on their cell phone cameras and sharing it with the public to make people 
aware. Sophia, do you sense anything that's different in the community in terms of maybe maybe it's just a level of, of being fed up? We've been impacted by the pandemic and now this. I think now that more and more, um, especially the elderly are coming out, um, they are the ones that are targeted because they are vulnerable. They won't fight back. There's fear in myself uh, being an Asian woman walking on Canal Street. And I think mental health plays a, a huge issue. The community is um, vigilant. We're uh, we're closing early. We care for the safety of our employees. What I've seen recently are these grassroots organizations that have stepped up. They stepped up to the plate to help us in the community that um, for so long felt so marginalized and unseen. Young, brave Asian Americans have come into Chinatown and volunteered to walk um, to walk elderly um, across the street or to their destination. They volunteered um, to send meals to um, those in need. Even though um, there's a lot of fear and anger in our community, I sense that there's um, a lot of pride and um, the, the, the younger generation um, is um, on the forefront of, of taking all these steps to ensure that this type of anti-Asian uh, sentiment doesn't continue further. Dr. Wu, Sophia had mentioned mental health and, and that has been a huge issue during the pandemic. People just coping with being inside, coping with the fear of the unknown uh, in this virus. And, and now there's the mental health issue of dealing with the unknown of racism. How have you seen that in your practice, if at all? We definitely have. Unfortunately, it has impacted um, many of our families. Um, I think you know the 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 fear, you know, that the anxiety um, about your your safety when you leave your house, especially also when you leave communities where there are less Asian Americans. Um, is is very real, and I think that for some of our patients, that means foregoing their you know their annual health visit with us because they have to hop on the subway to come to us. So it affects their ability to access healthcare. Unfortunately, sadly, um, in terms of you know the pediatric population, I think it's also affected their ability to access education. Um, you know, I mean, I've had parents who have flat out told me that they they will continue to keep their, their son or daughter out of school because of concern of their son or daughter taking the subway to school. And I think it's really sad that we are in this position where a family has to choose uh, safety over education for their, for their child. For so long, I think collectively, we've all thought about the pandemic and getting to the other side of the pandemic at the point of reopening. And here we are on the precipice of reopening and we're facing all of these issues, which still keep us as a community inside. Sophia, how do you feel about the reopening given the backdrop that we're facing right now? You know, even when we do reopen, there are so many businesses that have gone under that a full reopening won't um, really have much an effect. When um, businesses decided to close, it wasn't a spur of the moment type thing. I mean, we put our heart and soul into our businesses in Chinatown. Like my parents, for example, they're in their 70s. And so if they didn't have a succession plan to begin with, more likely than not, they decided that this was their time to retire. And so um, there are a lot of vacancies in Chinatown. And I'm hoping that um, when we do fully reopen, that there will be more young businesses because we are still um, the epicenter of um, all the Chinese communities. And so I feel like Chinatown can still be very vibrant. Um, I'm hoping that um, through um, throughout these next few months that there will be an interest in, in uh, businesses coming back to Chinatown. You know, how do you feel about the reopening given this context? Because everybody thought once we get vaccinated, you know, things will just return to normal, but it's not a return to normal for our community. Yes, it's wonderful that we're able to start to, you know, slowly kind of resume some semblance of our normal lives pre-pandemic. Pre um, but at the same time, as people are out and about more and, um, you know, our elderly and, and children and et cetera are, are able to go out, we are more exposed, unfortunately, to um, you know, to sort of the anti-Asian sentiment. Unfortunately, now that we're mixing with with um, with the entire community, unfortunately, the people who have those types of thoughts and 
um, feelings when they when they come across us on the street. Um, you know, there there may be uh, unfortunate encounters. Where do you think we will be uh, in six months and 12 months? You had mentioned, Dr. Wu, that a lot of patients were still putting off health care. I imagine they put off a lot of health care during the pandemic just for fear of, uh, of, of catching the virus. And now they're putting it off because of fear of racism. Um, what do you think the major issues are going to be in the next year? Vaccine rollout obviously is very um, is going to be, I think, a, a big factor in, in how the next six months to a year go. It's something that needs to be approached carefully in terms of the reopening. It's something that needs to be done so slowly because as we've seen, there are these variants um, and they're becoming very, very dominant now. So we do have to, I think, be cautious with the reopening. But I, I'd love if we can at some point um, get back to our, our pre-pandemic lifestyle. But you're hopeful. That's good to hear. <laughs> And Sophia, how about you? Because you have a different perspective being a business owner in Chinatown. Things may seem to be back to normal in terms of people getting out, et cetera. But, but can business return, do you think, to pre-pandemic levels in a year or so? I'm hopeful and I'm thankful for all the support that we've been receiving from these grassroots and um, longstanding um, organizations in Chantown that has helped the restaurant business so much. And I am so grateful for that. Well, Sophia, Dr. Wu, thank you so much for sharing um, what you've seen on the ground over the past year with us. Thank you. Thank you. We're here tonight to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Charles B. Wong Community Health Center, which would not be possible without the incredible dedication of the staff members. So tonight, we thank you, we honor you all. If you're at home, and you want to show some love, show some support to all these hardworking staff members, stay tuned for our live ask happening right after this. If there's one word to describe our staff, it is committed. They have shown a commitment to our patients and our community throughout this pandemic. I think what sets our staff apart from other health centers and other providers is that we have a wide range of staff here. They come from our community. They are the community that we serve. They see our patients as an extension of themselves or their families. They really treat them like they would want to be treated or their families would be treated. You never have to ask anyone to do anything extra. They will do whatever it takes to take care of people and take care of them right. I'd like to say that our health center staff past and present are extraordinary. They're dedicated to the highest quality of care and dedicated to serving our community. I've been really proud of our staff, the way they've really worked through this COVID pandemic. You know, they've taken risks to themselves and it really was not a lot known about the virus. But you know, people came day in and day out. They were really um, wanted to help the community help our patients, anyone who became ill. I would like to recognize all of our staff, in particular the administrative staff. They've had to do more with less during this pandemic, just like their colleagues on the front lines. Yet they haven't been recognized for their hard work in the same way. We couldn't have made it through the pandemic without everyone's dedication and sacrifices. I'm really thankful for our staff. They're fantastic, they're wonderful, they're professionals, they're dedicated, they have great hearts, they really care, and you know, I've never been in a place where people work harder. Because of our staff, we are still strong and we're still here to serve. Thank you to the staff of the Charles B. Wong Community Health Center. Thank you to all the staff. Thank you for everything you do and everything you do for our patients and community. Hey, I really wanna say thank you to our staff. You're the best. We're coming to the close of our program, but you know, it's not too late to contribute to this important mission. Simply click that donate button on your screen and don't forget to check out your pledge cart. If you have problems while trying to donate, you can email development at cbwchc, that's cbwchc.org, and someone will reply back to you. 
Well, there are so many thank yous in order. Thank you to the staff of the Charles B. Wong Community Health Center who have been working relentlessly throughout this crisis to serve our community. What a year you've been through. Thank you to our guest speakers, panelists, and host committee for their support. Most of all, thank you to all of our attendees tonight for joining us in the celebration. Your contributions will support patient care and operations during the pandemic and towards the road to recovery. We're almost there. <laughs> Don't forget to check out and make your donations count. Thank you. And may you all have a healthy and blessed evening.